morning from Philippians chapter 1, verses 27 through 30. And God's word reads, Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in the one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel, without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that they will be saved, and that by God. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for him, since you are going through the same struggle you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
to say the words in bold with me as we pray this prayer. Let us pray. God of knowledge and wisdom, bless all of our students, young and old, as they begin a new school year. As they grow in knowledge, teach our students respect for themselves and others. Bless all teachers and administrators as they welcome our children back. As they teach and nurture, grant them the grace and peace needed to lead. Bless our parents, grandparents, and all those who care for our children. As they nurture and encourage, grant them the wisdom needed to comfort and guide. God, as we face another year of uncertainty, demonstrate your faithfulness and protection to us. Fill us all with the joy of learning that we might be better equipped as your servants. Help us be your Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for our children and teens. They are a blessing and a joy to us. Or demonstrate your faithfulness to them as they journey with you. Lord, we pray for many needs of healing and restoration this morning that are represented among us. We believe that you are a God who hears our cry and that you are a God who is faithful to act on our behalf. Lord, this morning we pray specifically for Mel's friend Dawn, as her father is not doing well, and the family is discerning what kind of care she needs. Would you give the family strength and wisdom as they care for him? Lord, we also pray for our friend and former pastor, Mike Thompson and his wife Jody, as they recently lost uh, Mike's mother, comfort them in this day. Be present to them. May they know your love. And Lord, we also pray for our community, for those who do not know you, those who have not seen your faithfulness. Would you offer care to them? And would you equip us to be hands and feet that meet their needs? Lord, we pray all of this with your son's prayer in mind, as we say. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. As we were singing that song about moving mountains, my Sunday school class likes to know that I um, enjoy collecting church signs. And I don't steal them and keep them in my possession, but I mean, I, I read them and share them. And um, there was one church out in Independence on 291 that for a long time said, Sometimes God moves mountains, and sometimes he gives us a shovel. <laughs> and I thought, well, that's, and I think today you have an opportunity to pick up your shovel 
and you can help us move the mountain of our finances. And so today I pray for your continued faithfulness and the love you have shown to God and your church, both here and around the world, through your tithes and offerings. Let's pray. Dear God, I pray that you would bless us today, but bless us so we can be a blessing. Bless us so that we might be a light in this corner of our world that even as people drive by our church they will know that God is here and he blesses and and works through each and every one of us may your love shine through us Thank you for the tithes and offerings, but thank you most of all for the faithfulness that those tithes and offerings represent. In your name we pray, amen. Well, it is wonderful to be in the house of the Lord this morning. You know, as we look at all the things going on in our world, um, it is so important for us to continue to be a people who come together and gather together and are reminded week after week of whose story we are a part of. We are a part of God's story, and each time we gather in this place as the people of God, that is a powerful reminder to us. Our God is good. Our God is faithful. Our God is one we can trust. And for that, we give praise to God with grateful hearts this morning. I do want to make you aware of just a few announcements, uh, upcoming things in the life of St. Paul's that we want to make you aware of. The first thing is that tomorrow night, that's Monday, August 30th, we are going to have our young adult small group meeting at Pastor Colleen and Pastor Daniel's home at 6.30 p.m. Uh, tomorrow night is going to be a game night. Um, as many of you know, seminary students have come back into town. Uh, MNU started this past week, and our young adult group, represented by Pastor Daniel and Pastor Deborah, uh, had a booth at the MNU uh, fair this week. And so we invited students to come and to be a part of St. Paul's and a part of the small group. And so we are kicking that off tonight, uh, with a, or tomorrow night, with a game night, and so we are so excited for that. So if you are a young adult, or if you know a young adult who might be interested, we would love to invite them for that tomorrow evening at 6.30 p.m. On Wednesday, as usual, we will be having our Bible study at 6.30 p.m. Pastor Levi will be continuing through the study of 1 Samuel, so we invite you to be a part of that, and then our children will be meeting and having a lesson and activities as well. Also upcoming is Sunday, September 12th. That will be a Sunday of worship, but also we will be honoring our grandparents on that day. And I know that has traditionally been a very special day in the life of St. Paul. So if you would like to invite your family on that day, we would love to have your families come and join us for worship. And then on Sunday, September 26th, we will be taking up our alabaster offering. And so throughout the month of September, we will be reminding you of that and having um, different ways to prepare for that. But we want you to go ahead and put it on your calendar and know that it is upcoming. Uh, finally, we want to thank those who came and helped with the fall planting for the community garden yesterday. I want to thank Kelly Prince for her leadership in that. If you go out there, you will notice that there are some beds that appear empty, but there are no empty beds at this point. They all have seeds in them. So if you are on the schedule to water and to care for the garden, uh, please know that there are seeds there, so that does need to be watered. Um, if you are unable to water right now while it is so warm outside, please let either Kelly know or myself know, and we will cover that. We want to make sure that it's getting watered each and every day. Thank you so much to those who have signed up and taken care of the garden throughout this year. What a wonderful blessing that is for St. Paul's.
Well, good morning. morning. Grace and peace to you from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As always, it's good to be with you. Uh, You may notice that we're missing several uh, of our people this morning, so maybe just take a look around and see who's not here this morning and send them a text, give them a phone call or an email or a card this week and just let them know that they were missed. It's always nice to, to hear from those that are here that uh, that they, their absence was noticed. And, of course, we, we uh, certainly want to continue to reach out to one another and love each other as best as we can in these days. I know it's a challenge in a lot of different ways, but let's continue to be intentional about that. Uh, we continue in our series in the book of Exodus, chapter 5, starting in verse 1, and we will read... All of chapter 5. God's word reads. Afterward, Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Let my people go, so that they may celebrate a festival to me in the wilderness. But Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord, that I should heed him and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, and I will not let Israel go. Then they said, The God of the Hebrews has revealed himself to us. Let us go a three days' journey into the wilderness to sacrifice to the Lord our God, or he will fall upon us with pestilence or sword. But the king of Egypt said to them, Moses and Aaron, why are you taking the people away from their work? Get back to work. Pharaoh continued, Now they are more numerous than the people of the land, and yet you want them to stop working. That same day, Pharaoh commanded the taskmasters of the people, as well as their supervisors, You shall no longer give the people straw to make bricks, as before. Let them go and gather straw for themselves. But you shall require them the same quantity of bricks as they've made previously. Do not diminish it, for they're lazy. That is why they cry. Let us go sacrifice and offer sacrifice to our God. Let heavier work be laid on them, and then they will labor at it and pay no attention to deceptive words. So the taskmasters and the supervisors of the people went out and said to the people, Thus says Pharaoh, I'll not give you straw. Go and get your own straw, wherever you can find it. But your work will not be lessened in the least. So the people scattered throughout the land of Egypt to gather stubble for straw. The taskmasters were urgent, saying, Complete your work, the same daily assignment as when you were given straw. And the supervisors of the Israelites, whom Pharaoh's taskmasters had set over them, were beaten, and were asked, Why didn't you finish the required quantity of bricks yesterday and today, as you did before? Then the Israelite supervisors came to Pharaoh and cried, Why do you treat your servants like this? No straw is given to your servants, and yet they say to us, Make bricks. Look how your servants are beaten. You are unjust to your own people. He said, you're lazy. Lazy. That is why you say, let us go and sacrifice to the Lord. Go now and work, for no straw shall be given to you, but you shall still deliver the same number of bricks. The Israelite supervisors saw that they were in trouble, and when they were told, you shall not lessen your daily number of bricks, as they left Pharaoh, they came upon Moses and Aaron who were waiting to meet them. They told them, The Lord looked upon you and judged. You brought us into a foul stench before Pharaoh and his officials, and have put a sword in their hand to kill us. Then Moses turned again to the Lord and said, O Lord, why have you mistreated this people? Why did you ever send me? Since I first came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has mistreated this people. And you've done nothing at all to deliver your people. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious God, we ask that you would give us ears to hear the word for us this day. May the words of this scripture, uh, may they become your own words to us. May we hear with a new hearing and receive those words. And put them to practice the things that you would call us to be and to do in this time and in this place. We ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen. 
Well, you've probably remembered the story of Israel uh, being in captivity in, in Exodus, in the story of the Exodus in Egypt. Uh, they are living a life for 400 years enslaved under the oppressive thumb of Pharaoh in Egypt. And Egypt is an empire that is voracious in its appetite. To the point that it does not matter how people are treated, they are dehumanized because their purpose is only in serving the empire. That is the entirety of their purpose. And when people are treated as things to accomplish some sort of goal, what ends up happening is dehumanization. That persons are just treated as cogs in the machinery of the empire, of the society. Sometimes even the church, I can say it that way. Institutions that begin to see people as means to an end ultimately are participating in some kind of empire, some kind of empire building enterprise. And Pharaoh is one whose identity has become so wrapped up in the preservation of this empire that he doesn't even have a name. We don't know who Pharaoh is. But there's another kind of piece to that that might operate for us today. Pharaoh, without any sort of identity, becomes a mirror for ourselves. ourselves. We're not just talking about one historical person in the past. We can hold it up and say, perhaps I have become like Pharaoh. We can put ourselves in Pharaoh's shoes and wonder, ask the question, has my life become so disconnected from the life of people and how societies operate that we just say this is the collateral damage of doing life together? We don't really pay attention to how people are crushed under the wheel of empire as long as somehow we benefit from it. Pharaoh is not the only one who is benefiting from it in some sense. Did you notice that there were Israelite taskmasters? that were utilized to put the thumb in the back of the Israelites. They are enslaved, and yet their status is just high enough that they have some benefits from the system. They don't have to do necessarily all the hard labor that others are doing. They just have to observe and make sure that the quotas are being met. They benefit from the system. Despite the fact that they are just as much enslaved by this system, they're beaten because the quotas aren't being met. Despite the harsher realities that their work has been increased. Simply for the fact that people have begun to cry out about the oppression, about the difficulty of life. They have pointed out, which no empire can handle any sort of critique. They have critiqued the empire's life by their crying out, by drawing attention that life is not equal. It is not fair across the board. And they are being crushed under the wheel of empire. So the taskmasters, rather than join, joining in the outcry, are utilized as those who would enforce Pharaoh's will. And for them, there is some benefit to doing that. If they manage to accomplish the task that Pharaoh has set before them, they don't have to go back to the hard labor. They can enjoy sort of a, this is maybe a little bit of an anachronism, but a, a middle class life where they can get by without being crushed underneath the wheel. So Pharaoh and the taskmasters are often representative of an entire system that has dehumanized life to the extent that people no longer matter. And when the outcry comes, inevitably it comes, when the outcry comes, the response of every empire is, you should be thankful. Get back to work. You should be thankful that you have the privileges and rights that you do. You should be thankful. Get back to work. I wish I could think of some parallels to today. I'm sure I could think some if I really thought hard enough. But every empire
every, every empire, from first to last, will maintain its own life at the expense of every other one. One of the ways that this gets played out today in our contemporary society, in a society that values hard work, and let me just say, hard work is good and important. It is a great value to have. It's one of the things that I was taught growing up on farms. You have to work hard to get the tasks accomplished. But one of the things that it has evolved into is what some have called bootstrap theology. By bootstrap theology, we begin to say, you get what you deserve in life. You get ultimately what you deserve. And, and if you're in a place in life that doesn't seem very pleasant, the way that you work yourself out of that is to pull yourself up by the bootstraps, put on a stern face, get to work, and get yourself out of the hole that you're in. It is a pervasive theology that undermines, I think, in many ways, the grace of God that says you are a human being, not based on what you are able to accomplish, but just simply for the fact that you are made and created in the very image of God. It also, I think, takes out of the equation, this bootstrap theology, that sometimes there are things that are outside of the control of human persons that they cannot change by themselves. And the reason that they find themselves underneath the thumb, under the, the wheel of oppression, isn't because they haven't been working hard enough. In some ways, they may be required to work even harder. But it really pays attention to this reality that sometimes the way that our society, our systems have been created continue to perpetuate realities in which people are pushed down and crushed underfoot in order for society to move forward on its own agenda. I know this is a really heavy topic. Anytime that we begin to talk about politics and economics, immediately the defenses come up. I get it. It's so hard to talk about politics and economics in this day and age. We have immediately created these kinds of enemies between one another that it makes it almost impossible to have any sort of conversation. And we might even say that in looking at the life of the church, we are often telling pastors, you should not touch on politics. After all, what Jesus' whole embodiment is about is about saving your soul. But if you look at the Gospels and if you look at the Scriptures as a whole, one of the things that is constantly being brought up before Israel is the way that they do their political and economic lives. That God is deeply, deeply concerned about what we do with other human bodies, what we do with the land, what we do with creation. God is interested in what happens to this material stuff we call people, bodies, land, creation that we are part of. God is not just simply interested in some disembodied soul. He is interested in the entirety of your being. Amen. Every single person. In fact, the way that we know God cares about the material reality is that God became human himself. Became human and joined us in this world and said something about the material realities. In fact, Jesus says very little about heaven, but he has a whole lot to say about money. Jesus is interested, very interested, and God throughout the scriptures is interested in how we arrange life together. And God is also one whose voice is joined with those who are on the bottom rung of society, who are often being trampled underfoot. God cares deeply. Amen. In fact, as we have talked about previously in the book of Exodus, God sees, hears, and knows the oppression of God's people. That word, knows, is not just cognitive kind of knowledge. It means that God has experienced the suffering of God's people as if it was happening to God's own self. He has sent Moses to confront the realities of empire, to confront 
Pharaoh and the ways that society has been operating that have torn down the lives of God's people. Moses and Aaron are to be a mouthpiece before Pharaoh, who seems to hold all the power. You talked about, uh, Tim, uh, seeing a mountain. We say God can move mountains, but sometimes God gives you a shovel. Maybe it's a spoon. I don't know. And sometimes it feels so small and insignificant to the task before us. And for Moses and Aaron, the, the mountain that is sitting before them, that they have prayed God would move, is Pharaoh and Egypt. They are looking at this mountain of impossibility. What do they have to confront Pharaoh and this mountain of oppression that stands before them? They are utterly powerless other than the fact that God has called them to be truth tellers. To be ones who hold up a mirror before Egypt and before Pharaoh and to say, these are the kinds of people you have been. And God is calling for you to let my people go. I wonder as the church, if we might be the kind of people who are willing to hold up a mirror, not just simply before the world, but to take an honest look in the mirror at ourselves and to ask the question that I think has to be asked of any community, in what ways have we resembled Pharaoh and the Egyptians? In what ways have we been the kind of people that do not see others in all of their blessed imagery of God, but rather have seen them as threats to our security? We have seen them as uh, people who take up our job. We have seen them as uh, nuisances or pests. We have dehumanized them in such a way that we find it difficult that if they don't look and think and act like us, we just simply see that, or we imagine that the, 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 the life that they are in, the life and that the difficulty that they endure must be their own fault. I remember sitting down uh, when we were pastors many years ago. I was sitting down with a, a group of elderly men in the church and having conversation around lunch. They were talking about the realities of welfare. And they were bemoaning the fact that so many people on welfare seem to be lazy. That they don't go out and get jobs, and therefore they become like leeches on society and on them. Their taxes are raised, and there becomes this sort of groaning about this system, this net that was intended to help people out. They were talking about these people who are on welfare as if they are just lazy people. And if they would just go and get a job, then they would be able to get themselves out of this economic place where they are stuck. It was rather ironic, I didn't say this to them, but it was rather ironic that their pastor was on welfare. Working two jobs with a small child whose insurance I couldn't cover. There's nothing I wouldn't do as a parent to preserve the well-being of my child. Nothing. I had been taught from an early age that you work hard. You work hard. You get the education, you do all the things that you should, and you will find economic stability. You will find a place of rest. It will go well with you. That's what I was taught from an early age, and I worked my tail off in many ways, going through education and trying to figure out the best way of doing life and, and working as hard as I could. And yet, finding at the end of the month, there wasn't necessarily always enough check to go to finish out. It was kind of embarrassing for me to be thought of as lazy, despite the fact that I was doing everything I could to provide. 
They never knew that. But I, part of the reason I never said anything is because I know if I would have said something, I would have immediately been viewed as not working hard enough, lazy, a problem, a leech on the society. There's so many stories like that that I know, that I've heard, that I've witnessed. People who are on the edge of making it, always struggling. And it hasn't necessarily been because they've been lazy. They've worked hard, but they find themselves right on the edge of disaster. One medical bill away from defaulting on loans. I've, I've seen so many countless stories. And in the same sentence, I have seen so many church people that have viewed them as liabilities, rather than asking, how might we join alongside those, both who have plenty and those who don't seem to have enough, and enter life together? We have this sort of deprivation kind of mentality, the way that we view life in our society. And we have done this sort of thing, like Moses and Aaron, who come to Pharaoh in protest of the way that life has been operating. They come with their signs saying, this is not right. And Pharaoh automatically dismisses them and says, you ought to be happy with the lot that you've been given. Get back to work. You're lazy. Whether we're talking about the realities of racism or economics or politics, warfare, whatever it might be. There have been plenty of ways that we have said the life of this nation is far more important than the people who are in it. We are invested deeply in militarism. We have just kind of concluded a 20-year war where lives have been lost and a community has been devastated, absolutely devastated, so that it's infrastructure has deteriorated and rotted and fallen apart. And we're seeing in live, watching television, all of the ramifications of that as people are clamoring to get on planes to get out to something that would put them in a safe place. Afghanistan is not the only place where those realities have played out. Whether it's Central America, South America, Africa, the Middle East, there have been so many ways that we have been invested in militarism, which is a preservation of a society or an institution in the present moment without any concern for its future. Maybe I could say it this way. Out of the top 11 nations, when you put together their military defense, it still does not touch what the, mil the U.S. military spends in their budget. By $17 billion, the United States has the largest military budget than the 11 largest following. Simultaneously, our educational budget is less than 2% of the total. In other words, our investment in the life of our children and grandchildren into the future to help them have the kinds of, of learning and what it means to be a good citizen that kind of investment is far less than the investment that we give in propagating war. That should concern us as Christians. Because essentially what we have said, our present security is far more important than the future of our children. And in doing that, we have dehumanized our children. We dehumanized teachers. We basically said, you need to make more bricks with the straw that you've been given. Yes, you haven't had raises. You haven't had the, the resources that you need. Many of our schools here in Kansas City have barely passed accreditation. There was a time that they lost them. That's right. Where is the economic resourcing for that? As a community, we have to say this is problematic, that we have not invested in the teachers and the students 
And thus we have not invested in the future. And what is happening is we're beginning to see some of the fruits of that. In so many ways, we can be just like Pharaoh in Egypt. Now, one of the things that begins to happen, though, as Israel is in the depths of being enslaved in Egypt, Moses and Aaron trying to help out, trying to demonstrate that society has not lived out the ways of God in the world. The ramifications, that ripple effect of this, is that Pharaoh begins to become even hardened in his heart and says, you're lazy, and therefore we're going to increase your labors. The Israelites take it absolutely hard. Why wouldn't you? Life has become more difficult for them. It was already hard enough being at the bottom, but it has become even more pronounced. Their anger should maybe be pointed at Pharaoh and Egypt at the system, at the society that has pushed them to the bottom. But where is their anger directed? It's directed at Moses and Aaron who are trying to help. At the ones who are bringing up the protest, their anger is pointed at them. Moses in turn becomes angry. His anger though is not pointed towards Pharaoh and Egypt. Did you notice? His anger is pointed at God. Which says, why in the world have you not done anything when my people are being crushed? And so the displacement, the blame goes into different directions. Rather than pointing back at the system that has been destructive of lives, they point to the ones who have been protesting and creating issues. Or, they point towards God and say, where is God in all of this? I will admit that the last couple of years for me personally have been difficult as part of the church. That sometimes I become sort of jaded and cynical. I don't know if you've ever experienced that. I've also become somewhat jaded and cynical about our politics. And the way that there's this sort of clamoring for power, I become jaded at it. But the people I become frustrated with are not the ones who are the power brokers in society. I become frustrated with the people who are just across the aisle from me who are my neighbors, my family members. I become frustrated with them. I become antagonistic towards them and they toward me. We begin to rupture and disrupt between one another in such a degree that the system is never questioned and never checked. But these relationships have been ruined in some way. They've been disrupted. They've been devastated. The same is true for the church. There are a lot of young people right now who are very upset with the church. They're wondering where the church at, is at in the middle of these conversations. Why is the church not saying anything about racism? Why is the church not doing anything about poverty? Where is the church when the church is needed most? And in addition, where is God? Some of the questions that we are seeing high schoolers at ask and why they're not coming back to the church is because we have not always given them a very good answer to that question. In our avoidance of talking about politics and economics, we have essentially said, maybe God doesn't have a voice in this sphere. And when God doesn't have a voice in the political realities of our world, we really might ask, then what does it matter? In addition, and maybe worst of all, when the church's voice sounds an awful lot like Pharaoh's, when the church's voice is mimicking the language of the empire, people find it awfully difficult to break those two apart. And therefore they will say, then there's no place for me in the church. This is a really heavy topic. <laughs> I know this is heavy. And I don't say this to shame anyone. This is something that I have been wrestling with for a lot of years. As I've watched my family move away from the church, as I've watched high school students and junior high students that I had taught move away from the church, as I've watched pastors that have said, I can no longer do this. 
move away from the church. What I have seen happen time and time again is this bootstrap theology that says if you would just get it together, life would be better. But we have not asked the serious question, have we become like Pharaoh? Martin Luther King Jr. said this phrase, and I, I found it convicting. It is cruel jest to ask a bootless man to pull himself up on fruit straps. Right. It is cruel jest to ask a bootless man to pull himself up by the bootstraps. Right. I really hope, I really hope that bootstrap theology is not our primary mode and way of thinking of the world. Because what that ends up doing is when people come in here and they don't look exactly like we think they should look like, put together, everything going well, right, we end up saying, you have no place here until you can get it together. Work a little harder. You're just being lazy. The same is true for those who are homeless, those who are poor, those who come from different backgrounds. We begin to say the same thing over and over and over again. Unless you're helping this institution survive, you have no place here. We can do this as pastors. We can do this as churches as well. Where we begin to say, the life of the church is far more important than the people in it. Or, that the world as a whole is there to make the church succeed. Rather than understanding that the role of the church is to serve the world as the very hands and feet of Jesus. Amen. We serve a risen Christ who very much like Moses and Aaron comes right into our midst and begins to hold up a mirror before us. Saying these things, will you follow me? And I'll make you fishers of men. Are you willing to embody the love of Christ at great cost, even the cost of suffering on a cross? Are you willing to embody that kind of love that takes seriously not just sim simply the spiritual needs of the person, but the whole person? Seeing in each person the image of the living God. And not just simply as a cog in the machine of success and growth. To leave with one final quote, Dietrich Bonhoeffer says this phrase, that we are not just simply to allow the will of injustice to go rolling on, but we are to drive a shaft through the spokes of the wheels of injustice. That doesn't always mean that when we do that kind of work that it turns out well for us. That sometimes the difficult work of proclaiming the life of Christ in our communities, whether it's in the church or in the world at large, that the reaction may be, from those that we are trying to communicate the gospel, it may not necessarily be welcome receptivity. It actually might be the very opposite to begin with. That there might be antagonism and anger and fighting. There might be even attack that happens. Partly because they see us as part of the problem. They see us as part of the empire. They see us as part of contributing to what Pharaoh does to them. Pharaoh in all his sizes and shapes. But I hope like Moses and Aaron, that we will be persistent in being faithful, regardless of the immediate outcome that we would continue to be faithful where God has called us to speak the truth, to hold a mirror, and to continue to ask the question, 
whether we're like Pharaoh or we like Jesus. Let us pray. Gracious God, we, we recognize that there are a lot of difficulties these days that we are facing. Difficulties have come and gone time and time again. Empires have risen and fallen. Pharaoh has constantly been on the scene of history in different shapes and forms. And yet in the midst of that, you have been consistent in calling people to lift up the truth of your kingdom. That you are a God who does not look at bootstrap theology. You're, you're not interested in just simply us pulling ourselves up by our bootstraps and making something happen, but you are a God who joins us. And you also send us as the church to be out in the world and to proclaim the truth of, of your good news. That we would hold forth a, a different way, a different pattern of life that does not take advantage of people, but sees them in all the beauty of the Imago Dei, the image of God that they bear. So help us to have those kinds of eyes, that we would not just simply see people as cogs in the machine, but rather as beloved of the living God. And for all the ways, Father, that we have looked more like Pharaoh, we have talked like Pharaoh, we have sounded like the empire of Egypt, forgive us. Whether that has been true of us as a society or if that's been true of us as a church, whatever the case may be, would you hold the mirror before us so that we can see ourselves in light of who Christ is and that we might be honest about ourselves, not as a way of shaming ourselves and even saying, let's pull ourselves up by the bootstraps and let's make this happen, but, but that we might fall on your grace even in this moment and say, God, forgive us. That we might not be like Pharaoh to say the words, Who is God? I do not know them. But rather that we would say, You are a God who has loved us and given us grace upon grace. So help us. Help us to see our neighborhoods in a different light. Help us to see those who are struggling in a different light. Help us to see the ways that we have misappropriated things like funds and money and power for all the wrong ends. Help us to see the ways that people are being crushed and torn down. And may we be the church, the hands and feet of Christ, who offer peace and hope, love and forgiveness in the midst of a world that is so bent on destruction. We're not exactly sure all the ways that that should look. We're not even sure how we should do that entirely in our community. But we ask that you would give us a new imagination, that we would hear your call, and that we would be faithful to live out the kingdom way in the midst of our world. We ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen.
power of the Spirit, and the hands and feet of Jesus to the world around us. We are